across the Pacific in the United States, a furor is developing. You as an American teenager are offended by the people who treat the foreign singers and strike at the very basis of our existence as God-fearing, patriotic citizens. Well, I think we have a record of pictures and souvenirs of the pickup point about to be made. The bond between you and me, it will be known forever. You showed me how to be free, stronger than me. You'll be known forever. I know without me or three, I hope to stay around for some time. The things you read in papers Where truth is merely capers With misleading headlines A man as big as Jesus Would only want to lead us To the light like a Lord And there's something going on here, John There's something going on There's something going on here, John. There's something going on here, John. Welcome back to The Shadow of a Bass Man. And we're here today again with another wonderful topic that really people haven't touched on. And that is Mark Lane and Lord Bertrand Russell um, and Paul McCartney. And we have our co-host Ann Walsh in the house and filmmaker John Holbeck. Welcome back, John. Hi, thanks. Nice to Welcome see you. Ann. <laughs> Great having you back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm a little hoarse, so I um I'm gonna try not to cough. I've got a cough drop, so hopefully that'll help. Okay. That's all you're right. Fine. You're good. Yeah. We're glad you're here. Do you want to give some people the your background, John, and you you know on your previous film and your upcoming film because we don't know who's new and who has is aware of you and who is not type of a thing. Give them some background. Uh, right. So in 2015, I made a film about um, Paul McCartney and the uh, kind of the lead up to his death and replacement. Um, it's called the walrus and um i made the initial version which was like a sh like 20 minutes long and then a year later i came back and added to it and did like more of an extended version of it so uh what inspired me to make that film was just i had been researching the topic for about five years at that point and um having you know, already been a filmmaker, um, I was just inspired to kind of portray that information in a dramatic form. So um, I put together a script and uh, shot the film, not really expecting anything to come out of it. It was just kind of for my own satisfaction. Um, but after putting it online and I got a really surprising response from people, just people who were um, moved by it and affected by it. And uh, from that point on, it just kind of um, continued to be in my life. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I made the decision, you know, to, uh, to make a follow-up film, um, which is going to focus on uh, the last few years of John Lennon's life and in particular, the effect that, um, you know, what happened with Paul in 1966, the, the effect that that had on John up until the, the day of his death. And so that's what the, the this next film is going to be about. And it's um, called The Carpenter. So we have the walrus and the carpenter, which is kind of playing on the <clears throat> Alice in Wonderland imagery. Yeah that Paul loves so much. John, yeah, and John was so fond of referencing. 
so yeah, but uh, you know, I yeah, researching the topic since 2010, and just <laughs> kind of yeah. going going down the rabbit hole and trying to make uh, sense of everything. And it was important for uh, it was important for me from the beginning to say, okay, how you know this. How could this scenario have happened in reality? You know, and trying trying to take it out of the realm of the urban myth, you know, right. and, all, and all the clues and stuff like that that's associated with like the 1969 rumor, and seeding it more, you know, in reality and history, and say, okay, if this happened, you know, how could it have happened, and why did it happen? You know, so and ten years on, still trying to answer those questions in some form yeah. right which is where our book the shadow of a base man the first book picks up doing the same thing putting a storyline to what we think happened which actually falls in line with a lot of your movie your yeah. film mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and we We're highly much aligned we highly recommend um people going on youtube and finding john's i'll, film. I'll well, put the link in the description below uh, he portrays Paul the best. He really captures Paul's character and does some justice. And, you know, us in the community uh, really respect you and your research. And um, it's amazing what you've done Thank with you. these films. And, yeah. and for the community, you know. So it's, it's <clears throat> I know a lot. And I know we're all looking forward to the next one. So. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> You know, it's going to be there, John. Not, you know, whenever. <laughs> <laughs> so today we wanted to talk about Paul, obviously, with Mark Lane and Lord Bertram Russell. So you guys want to interject a little bit before I, I do have slides that we're going to put up. But yeah, so um, there's a lot of. Uh, you know, questions about that whole meeting, when it took place, what happened, um, and the information, you know, we find out there, it, it doesn't really give very many details um, to go by. So we just wanted to touch on this subject. It's very important because Paul was political and he was out there and, um, you know, investigating, wanting to know what happened to our president, John F. Kennedy. And there's a lot of questions around that. So we want to make sure that we can bring as much evidence out there for people to look at to show that Paul was active, politically active behind the scenes of Beatlemania. And we found some newspaper articles we want to bring forth and talk about Citizen Lane and uh, Bertram Russell and their important um, connections that the three of them had together. Right. So, um, but first yeah. we got to decide who Mark Lane is. Yeah, right. And pe people will say, why do you think Paul was replaced, killed, murdered, replaced, you know, whatever? These are these are some of those reasons and those aspects. Right. The motivations to um, assassinate him. And it was it was more than a car accident. And these are um, just viewpoints. For entertainment purposes, purposes <laughs> only. <laughs> these are the views of us and that's what it counts. But yeah, right, right. So Marianne, who was Mark Lane? Okay, who was Mark Lane? So as we, we do a little bullet here, he's an attorney. He was JFK's advisor. He was a New York State legislator, author, civil rights activist, and labeled as a conspiracy theorist. So we all know about conspiracy theorists, right? Where'd that label come from? That was pinned with the CIA. Pinned it. Go ahead, right. Jenny. As a result of Kennedy's assassination and people questioning the fact that it wasn't a lone shooter, there was more than one and and who who was planning this all out and conspiracy theorists then evolved into that catch all of trying to make people sound like they're kooks. Right. 
And when you break apart the two words, conspiracy is just a, a hidden plan for a criminal activity. And a theorist is really just somebody that's trying to figure out what's going on. It's not any different than in a detective trying to investigate a murder. It's kind of the same thing. Right. You know, you just try to figure out what's going on. And it's hard to find legitimate. Truth seeker. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it, it, truth seekers are the conspiracy theorists because we actually want to know what's going on as opposed to just being fed information that may or may not be accurate. Right. And stuff is, uh, you know, the government has a power to hide information from the masses. So right. It's really hard to um, get out there and really know what happened. I mean, we were still arguing what happened to our president. What, oh, yeah. Later? We still don't know. I just saw a documentary recently and I don't I don't remember. I'm sorry. I don't remember the name of it, but it was very good in showing what was going on there at and at that time at the grassy knoll and you actually can see from this film flashes which you know it would have been like the gunshots um one was on a um wall type thing that was there and and uh one some others from another area so it's it's amazing these things are now coming out but right. people have to get it Something somebody so if you go, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So if you go to this website, Matt Pro Video, um, you will see what we're talking about. Um, he has up there the account of Mark Lane visiting Paul McCartney. So you can go there and uh, read the account if you don't have Mark Lane's book, Citizen Lane. That's one way um, to get the information that we're going to be providing. Right. So Mark Lane, it looks like he died here in uh, 2016 at the age of 89, and he released Citizen Kane or Citizen Lane, the book that we're talking about in 2012, which was recounting his meetings with Paul and the discussions they had on Rush to Judgment, debunking the Warren Commission report. So here we here we have those Mark Lane. You've, he's in Wikipedia. Obviously, everybody's in Wikipedia. It seems, but you know what he what he who he was and his background. Um, he was a Vietnam War crimes investigator, um, state legislator, civil rights activist. Um, led the research um, on the assassination of Kennedy, as we were saying above. And then after his murder, and he was an advisor for Kennedy. So after his murder, I mean, I think that anybody that's a friend of somebody who's killed like that is wanting to know what happened. Hey, we want to know what happened to Paul. We didn't even know him. <laughs> but, you know, uh, this was a personal friend. So he was actually uh, very active, I believe, in trying to unmask what was happening. That's so, it. yeah. <clears throat> so the Columbia Dispatch is, is a, a, just a brief article explaining that uh, he published Rush to Judgment and he had the book and not really much else that he was trying to debunk the Warren Commission report. That's just the important bullet point there. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, with the conclusion that Oswald was the lone gunman was incomplete, reckless, or time at times and implausible, most definitely. Correct. So here, the, this is on uh, Bertram Russell. You want to bring his background in, either one of you? Um. Yeah, Bertram Russell. Let's see. I got bullet points on him. He was an Earl, a third Earl. So he was kind of up there. Where is that? Um, he was a mathematician, um, philosopher. He was a member of the advisory council of the British Humanist um, Association. He also started the campaign for nuclear disarmament founded in 1953. And he was a founder of the Bertram Russell Peace Foundation in 1963. 
and he organized the very first Who Killed Kennedy committed, committee, committed, committee, 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 thank you, <laughs> um, in 1964. So he got some scholars together to investigate the assassination into um, President Kennedy and what happened to him. So, um, John, the uh, campaign for nuclear disarmament, you found some information about them? Uh, well, there was a, uh, they had a chapter in Liverpool by the late 1950s. And, you know, our speculation is that, that uh, John and Paul were associated with that. And you have, I believe, a, a interview with Paul from 64, okay. where he, um, you know, is saying ban the bomb and um, talks okay. about his affiliation with the nuclear disarmament uh, um, movement of the time. Right. Um, do you have that uh, bullet point, Marianne? Yeah, they're 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 down below. Remember, we moved them down into that yeah. text. Yeah, they'll be coming up. Okay. So the thing that I noted here in this in this little blurb um, was that they were talking about when you know Mark Lane met McCartney at a party in London. But down here below, it says one of um, there was no. I guess it's on this next screen the amount of stuff that was at Russell when he died um, in 70 area here. One of the last things he received was this letter, no card, um, war is over Christmas card from John and Yoko. You can, you can see here, if my cursor's on it, little John's okay. little self image. Um, and he has one here, thank you for your good wishes. It helped a lot with love, John and Yoko Lennon. Illustrated with the self-portrait. So in the next slide here, um, we're seeing where Bertram Russell, uh, he had 500 boxes of documents made up mostly of letters and manuscripts, as well as a personal library of a few thousand books. Interesting items included 1950 Nobel Prize Medal for Literature, his pipe and glasses, as well as letters from Albert Einstein, Lenin, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, as well as Muhammad Ali. So yeah, I just found those um, pictures the other, last yesterday or the day before, and uh, thought that was interesting that John, John went into that circle as a result of, you know, Paul's uh, meetings coming back, which I think we'll see later on in, in one of the bullet points. Right, which is different than the account that um, Paul Tupelang oh, talks about. Right. And we'll um, point that out also. We'll point that out, but just so then everybody remembers, this is where this was coming from here. Right. Okay, here's where we were talking about, you were talking about the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, so this is a newspaper article from the Youth Against Bombs. And uh, it was dated Easter 1964, and they had an interview with Paul. And uh, the highlight of the interview was the Beatle against the bombs. And so Paul was known as that. He was against um, nuclear weapons, and he was known for being the Beatle that uh, talked about it and was um, active about Politically right. talking, you know, talk, talking about it. Bringing we have up. pictures of that later up coming too. But what I found interesting about this was that this symbol for the campaign for nuclear disarmament was what we now label as the peace symbol. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. We never, no one, I mean, growing up, that was always, you know, the peace sign was always a thing. Um, but it was never made clear as to where how that symbol was created. So interesting. Yep, it came from the CND. No, I'm not quite sure what this. Um... Oh, I can't read it very well. Sorry. 
Um, it's the Lake Forest College 30th mm -hmm. annual. Um, they had a speaker there. Um, the title was The Warren Report, The Philosophical Analysis of the Warren Report by Bertram Russell. Oh, yes, he's the one that came up with uh, the Who Shot Kennedy Committee. Right. To debunk, yeah, that's just an article that was found to show that yes, he was involved. Three of the earliest and most influential critics of the Warren Commission's report on the assassination of President Kennedy were professional philosophers Bertram Russell in early 1964 organizing the Who Killed Kennedy Committee, befriending Mark Lane, author of the first serious critique of the Warren Report, Rush to Judgment. I think there's an important point here to emphasize is that the the critics of the uh, Warren Report, I mean, there were lay people, but it was, was also intellectuals, philosophers, uh, professors uh, that question, you know, critique the report and uh, saw the all the ways in which it was lacking and the, um, you know, started raising questions, you know, so it wasn't a bunch of kooks, you know, or people who were, you know, Mark Lane himself. Right. Mark Lane himself accepted, you know, the uh, the initial reports of of Oswald having killed Kennedy, and it wasn't until, you know, these guys read the actual report and said, okay, there's a lot of holes here. There's things that are obviously being ignored or not explored thoroughly, and so from an intellectual perspective, they were just like, you know, this needs to be brought out and critiqued and challenged. And as time went on. And they came up against more and more resistance is when this whole, like we were talking about earlier, uh, idea of the conspiracy theorists came about, you know, and there are actual internal CIA memos from Richard Helms, who was the CIA director in the late 60s, you know, developing the label of conspiracy theorists. And like, right. okay, because they had to come up with a way to discredit discredit and demonize and it was hard because like i said i mean a lot of these people were like russell and and uh lane were intellectuals they were professionals you know and uh so they had this challenge okay how do we make these people look like they're they're crazy <clears throat> There were also the other, there were a couple other ones that, like you said in the beginning, that were laying that out, the Warren, com, uh, the commission, I guess it was maybe them. And one of them was my state senator, Arlen Specter. Right. And yeah. I'm, I, there was a couple of them that were actually wanting to seek, find the truth out about what was going on. Well, Arlen Specter is actually the, the one responsible for coming up with the magic bullet theory. Um, yeah which was an attempt to account for all the wounds <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in Kennedy and both um, because the whole, the thesis of the Warren Commission was that Oswald had fired um, three shots. Mm -hmm. So three shots had to account for all, all of the wounds uh, in both Kennedy and Governor Conley, who was sitting in front of him. So Spectre, in order to make that work, he came up with this, <laughs> absurd idea that one bullet um, caused the damage to Kennedy's yeah. neck and to multiple places on Conley. And this bullet was supposed to have penetrated uh, Kennedy's neck, gone through, and then hit Conley in the back, and then gone into Conley's wrist, and then ended up in his thigh. <laughs> so, um, it's it's just an absurd. I realized it was that crazy <laughs> theory. Yeah, yeah, and and mm -hmm. the bullet that was supposedly still fully intact but slightly flattened, <laughs> you know, um, and found later on a, on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital. It's the magic bullet. <laughs> yeah, well, it can do anything. <laughs> and also, the rifle that was used was a bolt action, and it was known to be troublesome. It. It wasn't very accurate, accurate. Yeah. and you know, so to fire off as many as he was supposed to 
um, is nearly impossible. Well, they had back exactly. then, they had sharpshooters try and recreate the shots and mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't do it. Um, I think maybe they were able to do it with a stationary target, but they, they were never able to duplicate it with, uh, they never actually tried, I think, with with an actual moving tar target. They didn't replicate the circumstance exactly to try and see if it could be done. Could and all, the driver, <laughs> of the, you, somebody would still have had to been in their car to drive the car for a dummy. <laughs> right, and and Oswald's record from the army, he was not a good shot. He was an abysmal, <laughs> yeah, uh, shot. So the idea that someone you know, who's not a good shot could make this, could do that shooting with a, you know, a, a $12 rifle or whatever it was, is, is crazy. Right. And it was found in the book depository, wasn't it? Up on the sixth floor? Yeah. In the book depository? Yeah. The, wasn't it? The gun, the rifle? Well, the problem, <laughs> the thing with that is, is there were actually several different rifles found, which was something that was later covered up. Because initially they found uh, a Mauser rifle, uh, which would have been something much better suited to an assassination. They found there, they, it was reported they found uh, a Mauser and then that was covered up. And then it's like, oh no, we, we it was this uh, Manlikirk Kirkano you know, cheap Italian rifle that, that we found that Oswald had ordered. Um, but then the chain of custody, custody on that's really shaky. And, and it turns, um, there was actually several different of those rifles that were claimed to have been Oswald's. There's the famous uh, photo and, and footage of the police holding up Oswald's rifle, you know, and showing it, displaying it. But if you compare that to pictures of Oswald's actual rifle, it's a different one. The barrel is shorter, uh, the, the, the strap clips on it are in different places, you know. So it's just. Yeah. The thing with the Kennedy, Kennedy assassinate, anything you look at, <laughs> you find elements like that that don't make sense. There's so many contradictions. Um, that shouldn't be there. And then, you know, that's what Mark Lane and Russell and uh, the, the, the others like them found was all these discrepancies, you know. It's like, well, if this was just a simple case of a lone gunman doing the shooting with a rifle he bought, all of these problems shouldn't be here. And not only should they not be here, there shouldn't be an effort to cover up anything, you know. And I think as it went on, that was the big thing that blew everyone's minds was it's like, if this is as simple as the government has said it was, why all this resistance? You know, right. why this persecution? It doesn't make any sense. Correct. And after Kennedy was assassinated, you had a whole chain of people that mysteriously died. And then you, you yeah. kind of see that with in this case, with the, a rumor of Paul's death, that there's a whole chain of people that were in the know that suddenly died. So um, it's it's similar in some ways to Kennedy, but obviously Kennedy had like 50 of them <laughs> die right. within three years or something. But it's the same thing with Paul. You start to see people drop off. Yeah, yeah. They were in the know. A day in the life just came to me in my head while you guys were just talking about that and he blew his mind out in a car you know he so it was just maybe you know more double double talking on cause and effects john was good at that speaking double mm -hmm. double meanings all right let's see so here we go into bertram russell's peace foundation that he created in 63 human rights, peace, social justice, and that, that continued on. And there's more information here for anybody who wants to look up Bertram Russell here. Um, and they are still active in England. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he died in 1970 at the age of 97. 
Okay. So by the time that um, Paul, Mark Lane met him, he was in his 90s already. So he's. Right, because yes. I'm, I forget what year he died, but it was shortly after 1970, wasn't it? Somewhere in there. He died 1970. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is just us telling you guys, this is our information that we've come up with. So we'll go on from there. Um, so I'm going to read these and then you guys can, can go ahead and we'll discuss each bullet point. While living in London during that time, I attended a small party of about a dozen people. One of them was Paul McCartney. He walked up to me, offered his hand, and told me his name. The introduction was hardly necessary as he was one of the most famous people in the world. He seemed very young and remarkably modest. That was because he was 22 years old and he was not impressed with his accomplishments. So for Paul to be 22 years old at the time of this meeting, it would have had to take in place between June 18, 1964 until June 17th of 1965. Correct. Um, what are you, what's your thoughts, John? I think, well, maybe to give some context to um, this quote, just for people who don't know. So Mark Lane um, came out as a critic of the Warren Commission and was trying to develop a book and documentary of explaining why the Warren Commission was wrong and utilizing interviews with witnesses in Dallas. And he was not able, he was gonna do the book and then the film, but he was not able to get the book published anywhere in America. No publisher would accept it. So he had to go to England to in order to find a publisher to to publish the book rush to judgment and he uh you know he had befriended bertrand russell in 64 and so russell was helping him so uh in late 1965 mark lane was staying in london and it was during this time that he met paul at a party and paul was very interested in he had heard about the manuscript rush to judgment was interested in reading it and so mark lent him his manuscript and that's you know what these what these quotes are discussing um you know mark saying that paul was uh 22 i think is probably just him getting um confused or or because citizen lane was the book was written came out 2012. 20 2012 you know so it's 50 years later and uh, I think this is probably just, you know, it was actually in 65, Paul was 23, but. Yeah, because you know. you're saying the before Christmas is 65. So Paul would have been 20 right. and a half. Okay. Right, <laughs> right. So I don't, I don't, I'm not so sure that, you know, him saying 22 years old should be taken, you know, absolutely, literally. Right. I mean, right. being off by a year or two is not. Well, we're much. six months. <laughs> and you <laughs> not write a book 50 years later, I mean. Well, and, I mean, just as a kind of a research note is you see that a lot in kind of accounts from, uh, 50 you know, years ago. 50 years ago. It's just like people, you know, sometimes they get off by a year, you know, they and and of course, uh, you know, in some sense, it's no big deal. But when you're, when you're doing focused research where a year or even, you know, in the case of Paul, where a couple months or even weeks is very important, you know, to to to, to know exactly, then, yeah, it becomes a bigger deal. But Right. So the next quote here says, he being Paul said, I understand you have written a book about Kennedy's assassination. I would like to read it. I told him that it was still in manuscript form and that there were only two mimeographed copies, one at the publisher's office and one at the flat where I was staying. So he's he's actually telling Mark Lane, you know, I understand you have this. I'm interested in it. I want to know about Kennedy's assassination. Yes. Um 
that's just showing that he did have an interest and Paul was out there and he was talking about it politically, uh, publicly. And we'll see that later on in the slideshow, um, his quote that he said about Kennedy's assassination. Right. That's very important. And, and it's showing here too, that registered judgment was released in August of 1966. So we're talking about a window of nine months from maybe Paul first meeting Mark Lane till that rush to judgment came out in a year until what we think Paul was taken out. Oh, yes, yes. So several days later, he returned with the manuscript neatly wrapped. And then a few days later, he, Paul invited me to his home suggesting that I drop in at about noon. He opened the door and showed me to a parlor, asked if I minded waiting a few minutes as he walked into another room where John Lennon was seated at a piano. Paul called out, Mark, this is John. John, this is Mark. We each said hello, and the two of them continued working on a song. They hummed, they sang, and they played the piano, and Paul played the guitar. When they were satisfied, with, when they, were satisfied they agreed to call their associate who is going to write it down. Neither Paul nor John could write music. This is such an important section here um, from the conversations that we've been having lately um, going on on other channels about the Beatles and writing music. Yes, yeah, so we actually have a witness to somebody that saw John and Paul writing a song. Yeah. Which they couldn't do, apparently. But we know that's not true. Because there's plenty of people out there that have seen John and Paul write music. Right. So this is just one of those accounts of somebody actually witnessing them writing a song. You know, what well, Paul had the piano and John had the guitar. Um, so, yes, they did play their own instruments. Somebody saw them playing their own instruments and writing a song. <laughs> I did watch uh, an interview of... of topics just uh, over the weekend um of the beatles what was actually ringo was talking and he was talking about early days this was an early video so this was a video done in like 64 65 saying how that when they recorded all the songs that were recorded on that their first album first two albums or whatever were all theirs except for one he said they were john and paul's except for one which probably was Till there was you, because we know that wasn't written by them. <laughs> that was a show tune. Right. Right. So for this meeting to happen, um, if it was if it happened at Cavendish, we know Paul moved into Cavendish in April of 1966, and he was 23 years old at that time. And of course, Lane met John Lennon is important too. Um, John, any thoughts? Um, probably, you know, this meeting um, took place in late 65, just based on uh, cooperation from other sources about when Lane was in London. Um, yeah. I, we have the other slide that will come up when we were talking more about that time frame where we were right. questioning that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this if you want to get into or not. Uh, yeah, kind let's, of. let's move on to that. And we'll see. I know I know it'll pop up when we get into uh, where Martha pops in. <clears throat> okay. So then we had lunch prepared by a woman who worked there. It was sliced white bread toast toasted and covered with baked beans, apparently a Liverpool favorite. Well, right there, you would think that it would had to have been the spring of 66, if they're at Paul's flat. My, you know, that's my. Yeah, I, from when, when I read this uh, account of Mark Lane, I, I figured that they must have met at least four to five times. So it's, I find it very difficult to really pinpoint where, what they time were. They, were. they were. Well, in the book, Citizen Lane, the last meeting with Paul 
or I guess the last one he talks about anyway, is uh, they're also meeting with uh, Emil D'Antonio, who was the director of the documentary film version of Rush to Judgment. Um, and according to D'Antonio's biography, the period that he was in London raising funding for the film was between October, December of 65. So at least the meeting with uh, D'Antonio had to have taken place in late 1965 because that's when he was in uh, London. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because here also the number six here says Paul's very large English sheepdog stayed outside guarding the house. Well, Martha wasn't born until June 16th of 66. Mm -hmm. Not a very large English sheepdog at that <laughs> point. Um, so he's a puppy. He's I don't a puppy. know. Right. I don't know if this is maybe, you know, if the say the meetings at the house actually took place in late 65, which would have put them at the uh, Asher residence where Paul was living at the time. And, you know, Mark probably would not have been aware of, you know, the fact that that wasn't Paul's house. Um, but, you know, if that's the case, then perhaps the Ashers had a sheepdog, you know, um, because there's no way, yeah, I mean, like, like, even if the meetings took place at Cavendish Avenue in spring of 66, Martha wouldn't have been there, you know, yeah. anyway. And again, uh, this could also be, you know, um, just as he's writing, you know, Mark Lane going on the kind of cultural awareness of Martha the Sheepdog, how, uh, you know, uh, Paul McCartney is known to have this big sheepdog, so he's just kind of putting that in as kind of extra flavor in the uh, in the account. So it could be that too. It's possible. That right. could have been Paul had another dog that we don't know about. That was kind of my thinking when I read the account. Mm -hmm. um, I can't find but any information, only that he had a cat, Thisbe, and Martha. But so. he had Eddie. He had Eddie, the Yorkshire Terrier, which was actually, I think that was actually Jane's dog. But I don't know when Eddie came into the picture. I don't know if Eddie was at the Ashers. Was the Yorkshire Terrier is not an English sheepdog, big. But <laughs> there are pictures of Paul, Jane, and and uh, Eddie. I just don't know when that when that dog appeared because it seems like everything was about Martha. And if Eddie was Jane's dog, that you know what I mean. It's it was not Paul's um, background. Right. Right. And the woman that uh, worked at the house and and number five. Yeah. Could that have been um, the Kellys, George Kelly's wife? Because I know they, she worked there too as his maid. Mm -hmm. If they and were at the Asher, I mean, were, if they were, if they were at Cavendish, Ann, then that would have been the Kelly, you know, the Kelly lady, you know, Mrs. Kelly. But if they were at the Ashers, it would have been somebody that worked for them, right? Yes. Like I said, this is really hard to really pin down. Pin down. Yeah, the the facts. So it's hard to, you know, right. clear the water so we have a better picture of what was, what was going on at that time. All right. Well, then moving on to seven, he did call a few days later and suggested a late dinner at a place I might recommend, he being Paul. I told him about a Polish restaurant where the food was excellent, and since all the dinner would, diners and staff were ancient and spoke primarily Polish, he might not be recognized. So this is like meeting number three. Yes. Yes. And I, didn't he dress up in a disguise at this meeting? No. What I was reading on this particular meeting was because they thought it was going to be um, a Polish restaurant, no, nobody was going to be there to recognize him. Okay. They were seated near a window. There was a 90 some year old lady who asked the waiter to bring, see if Paul would autograph her menu for her granddaughter. And by that time, there was a crowd of people outside the window. 
they ended up having to leave through the back door. Okay. So, yeah, I was reading on that meeting and I was like, oh, this is interesting. I thought it was a disguise, yeah, I didn't do. Yeah, there's no mention of being in a disguise, but just the fact that he didn't think he would be recognized there. Well, that was an understatement. <laughs> So here, meeting number four, I met with Paul McCartney at my flat. He asked about the film and I described it. Okay, yeah, so this is the fourth meeting. They met again. We don't know exactly when this fourth meeting took place. But in John's film, The Walrus, he covers some of this with meetings with uh, Mark Lane. So it's really super good. Yeah, the the um, in kind of my research process when uh, Citizen Lane came out in 2012, it was a big kind of breakthrough because <clears throat> I had already I had researched the JFK assassination quite a bit up until that point, and I knew once I read these accounts, um, because one of the big issues with with the Paul is dead thesis. If you're going to contend that it wasn't an accident, you have to come up with <laughs> a pretty good motive for why they would have taken the risk of assassinating Paul and also replacing him. Um, mm -hmm. So it would have had to have been a, a pretty, um, uh, there would have had to have been a pretty important motivation to do that. And so when Citizen Lane came out, um, it was kind of clear to me that all oh, this would have been Paul McCartney being associated with oh, with research like this and becoming not only but taking the next step to become involved in and we'll read about it here in a in a minute of providing music for a documentary film. Uh, challenging the government, U.S. government's position on the assassination, the influence that would have had, particularly on the youth, would have been tremendous. I mean, it would have, it would have, I think, changed the whole paradigm and would have given the, the I don't know if you call it the truth movement at that time, but it would have given that the momentum it would have needed to have breach these barriers that the establishment was putting up to try and keep this information from getting out and trying to make these people look, you know like they're crazy um so the the fallout from that i think would have been i i don't think could be overstated you know and so when i read this i was like this is a huge thing you know and i'm not saying that it was the only motive for killing Paul or needing to get him out of the way, but I think it was a central part of it. And so when the time came around to make the walrus, I was like, I, yeah, I need to include this because, because it needs to kind of be the linchpin, you know, because I think it was that important. Do you want to read nine and 10, John? <clears throat> sure. Um, well, he said, meaning Paul, I would like to write a musical score for the film as a present for you. I was astonished by that generous offer and speechless for a moment. I thanked him, but then I cautioned him that the subject matter was very controversial in the United States and that he might be jeopardizing his future. Uh, and so Paul's response to that was to say, uh, one day my children are going to ask me what I did with my life and I can't just answer that I was a Beatle. It became clear to me that he had not grasped the enormous contribution he had made to music and to the lives of young people everywhere. Yeah, and at 23. Mm -hmm. His humbleness showed there, I think. And this kind of hits on a central point. Um, is. To kind of make sense. Of the whole Paul is dead idea. Um, and I think to ground it in reality. Uh, you need to have a clear understanding of who Paul was, you know, what his values were, what he cared about, uh, what his personality was. 
because it's a it's a central component of why there was a need to get rid of them you know um so he wasn't he wasn't just this mindless pop star you know who who you know had no deeper worldview or ideology or values he was someone who you know was a deep thinker who who thought yeah. about the issues of his time you know we saw in 64 he was <laughs> you know all about nuclear disarmament you know uh so to to have someone like that who's uh who has all this awareness and also has all this power uh was a huge thing um yeah and I, so I think that's, you know, it's important to, to just the context of the whole situation to understand that, you know, not only for the purposes of realizing, okay, why, why was he targeted, but also to differentiate him from the Paul McCartney who came later, <laughs> you know. Um, very different values. Yeah, very. His values are far different than what Paul was. Um, he was a good humanitarian and that he was ahead of his time too with investigating the Kennedy assassination and bringing out the truth and things like that. He was uh, a brilliant man and ahead of his time. I think like too, another thing to point out is, is, you know, like questioning the establishment at this time and kind of having a curiosity about uh the things was was common you know i mean it was uh you know among like the, the the i mean i know uh, i can't think of sp specifically off the top of my head but a lot of like the sort of um musicians of that time you know these figures in the pop world and stuff like that you know had questions about things like the kennedy assassination and you know all these different but what made paul different was like i said from taking that next step to oh this is i don't only have i have this intellectual curiosity but i'm willing to take it to the next step and actually do things to <clears throat> help uncover the truth and to directly challenge these narratives and i think that's a crucial point you know um yeah and he made that very clear when he said that he wanted, he couldn't just tell his children that he was a beetle. He wanted to do something. He wanted to make a positive change in the world. And let's not forget, too, he was the vocal, you know, they were vocal on the segregation um, with Jacksonville's concert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another very hot topic. <clears throat> in this country before at that time you know segregation kids were bused um you know buses were segregated they you couldn't the things that were it's just crazy now thinking back how all that was going on but they were very big proponents of taking down those barriers mm -hmm. and that, that they wasn't done <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they started that so and it's really sad because it, I think at that time they were kind of viewed as mindless men, un, not very no talented, option. you know, and they could be easily pushed around and told what to do. And but that wasn't the case with Paul or John, you know, they um, they fought the establishment and, and broke a lot of barriers. And like this, Victor Spinelli said, you know. They were actually, John and Paul were geniuses and they had very, very deep conversations, intellectual um, conversations. Um, they were once debating about um, Freud and, uh, oh, what was the other, um, forgot the guy, other guy's name. He's a famous psychologist, Young. Young, yeah. Yeah, and they were debating on their, their interpretations of dreams. And I can't imagine having a conversation like that with somebody. So, 
and they read all the time and they were always studying, yeah. learning and growing. That's stuff people do now, interpretation of dreams, but they didn't really back then. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. were dating, you know, Freud and Young. Yeah. And that was well, really by Spinelli. And if people go back and look at pictures, Paul always had his face in a, in a newspaper. Yes. He was always reading what was going on in the world. So it would be natural for him to want to have an interest in the JFK assassination. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's documented as well, that they were on tour um, playing um, when they found out that he, the assassination happened. Um, and they were really, you know, they found out after they got off stage, but they were deeply affected by that. Thinking he was the president that was going to make the change. And being young people at the time, they wanted change. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't. All like, right. Who wants war anyways? You know? Yeah. So during that meeting, Paul said he had just finished composing a song and he wanted me to hear it. I had apparently been the first person to hear Eleanor Rigby. Um, reading that that context in the book was interesting as well because Mark Lane has says he has he's tone deaf. He doesn't, you know, can't can't get things. And he only remembered the fact that it had something to do with some father doing something with a sock. And <laughs> um, I forget what he said. Um, the other part was, but <laughs> I thought that was amusing. But he was there listening to Eleanor, Rig, you know, John or uh, Paul's rendition of that. He had just finished composing a song. So when did he, the, Eleanor Rigby was um, recorded in April and June of 66, but he was just composing it at that time. Yeah, and it could take Paul up to a year um, to complete a song because of a busy schedule that they had. And Right. So. Like with Penny Lane, I read that it took him almost a year and a half to yeah. almost complete that before he passed. Till he said, it's done now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way I like it. But yeah, with um, that, that accounting was rather interesting. Um, so then the next is I arranged a meeting at the Kings Road flat for Paul and Dee and myself to discuss the subject. So we're, now we're at meeting number five. Who is D? Uh, that's the filmmaker, D. Antonio. Antonio. Mm -hmm. Okay. The film without a musical score was a stark enough as was moderately successful, debuted on the BBC in 1967. Yeah, so Paul did not write that score um, because they felt that it would be too dangerous for him. Right. Uh, John, did you have more information on D'Antonio? Um, he was kind of like, from what I understand, a, a pretty brilliant, you know, documentary filmmaker, but pretty cantankerous to work with. And uh, the, the Paul would have done the music, but it, during this meeting, I, um, D'Antonio was like, well, provide an example. And, yeah. and Paul was like, well, I can't, I need to, can't, can I wait and watch the film? And then he's like, no, 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 you need to do something now. So Paul just, you know, on the guitar, just like, you know, started fooling around. And D'Antonio was like, no, no, no. He's like, you know, the film needs to be, I think he said, stark and didactic. And, you know, it, doesn't need music anyway, basically is the gist. <laughs> so uh, if it hadn't been for his attitude, Paul probably actually would have would have worked Went ahead with it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He he was saying based didn't Paul, you know, basically say it was what he was composed there at that moment was based on the beginning scenes of the film and that was what it reflected. Yeah, I think 
Yeah. He, yeah, they started, they said, gave him a little description of what the beginning scenes would be. And so Paul was trying to work with that. So it sounded like he needed something he needed visual. More. <laughs> mm -hmm. He needed visual to get Which is it. typically how it would go is, you know, a composer would watch the finished film, you know, or at least, you know, footage from it and compose to that. But, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, D'Antonio was, you know, he was, um, he was on the board of, of uh, Bertrand Russell's piece, uh, and later had a falling out with with Russell. And so he was someone who was, you know, difficult to get along with and work with, apparently. But uh, yeah, that's what it sounded like. So during this time, a letter arrived from London that was of interest since I did not know anyone in London. It was an offer to help from Lord Bertram Russell. Yes, yeah, so that's how this all started was um, Bertie, uh, what's his nickname, uh, wrote a letter to Mark Lane asking him to, come, he had an interest asking him to come over to London and meet. So all these references now are from his book, um, Citizen Lane. I would just want to clarify that. Okay. So, so when I told Bertie that I was interested in talking about the case in Europe, he suggested that the Peace Foundation he led could set up the meetings in various countries. So there you have Russell through his Peace Foundation organizing, financing Mark Lane's book and or Rush, Rush to Judgment, his movie. I spoke at a meeting in Vienna on December 18th, 1964. It was the first lecture sponsored by the Vienna branch of the Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation. So that's just trying to pinpoint, okay, when did Russell meet Mark Lane? So it would have been before, been before. the number of 64 mm -hmm. to get all that set up. Mm -hmm. I lived in a room on the King's Road near Wood World's End, London, in a large flat owned by the Bertram Russell Peace Foundation. That's his location. And that's just pointing out that the Peace Foundation was supporting Mark Lane. <laughs> <laughs> they paid his rent. They were, he was in their room. However, the real boon came from the Lane's friendship with Ralph Schumann, secretary of the Bertram Russell Peace Foundation, who seemed to promise free space and access to money for their critique of the Warren report. And that was just another example of them helping Mark Lane with the financial burden of uh, rush to judgment. On one autumn afternoon in 1965, the entourage of the D'Antonio Lane and Showman solemnly trooped to 34 Hasker Street to meet Lord Russell at his London home, then in his 90s, which we had already clarified that. And that came from... Emilio D'Antonio. Yeah. yeah, that's his account in his book, The Radical Filmmaker in Cold War America. And that's just, we finally have a date there showing that the meeting between those three happened in autumn of 65 and yeah which is what you said john correct mm -hmm. russell invited the filmmaker to join the board of directors of the foundation lane was also asked um yeah so that's just them recounting that uh, d antonio was on the board of directors with the peace foundation so we were just trying to make all these little connections Points. so people yeah. understand what was going on, you know, with this whole Peace Foundation and what was going on with Rush to Judgment. Right. And who November, what? November 29th, 1966, he, D'Antonio, wrote to Russell resigning from the Foundation's Board of Directors because of showman's mismanagement. Yeah, so that would have been after Paul's alleged death. Right. And he just up and uh, quit the board of directors 
probably just for conflict reasons, <laughs> sounds like. But it happened afterwards. Lane claimed that Paul McCartney agreed to write a score for the film because one day my children are going to ask me what I did with my life and I cannot just answer that I was a Beatle, though nothing came of the promise. So this is now D'Antonio's accounting of what we already had from Mark Lane. Right. So he had those two references out there to um, go by. Yeah. And here's what we were talking about is the, the book Radical Filmmaker in Cold War America. It's the cover. Yeah, and that picture was taken out of our collection, the three of us. Yeah. Or our collection, so this is our personal property. Okay, so here's the here's the interactions with Paul and Russell. Jane Asher and Paul McCartney visited Bertram Russell twice in 1966, on Saturday, 18 June, and the following Monday. This is according to Edith Russell's appointment diary in which she recorded their arrival at 4 p.m. and on Monday that they stayed till 6.30. Evidently, this was an extended tea time with their young visitors. Paul was celebrating his 24th birthday on 18 June. Yeah, so. It's a great way to spend your birthday, right? Yeah, sure. 90, the 90 year old man discussing, you know, go ahead. Well, he had more fun than I did, believe me. Um, yeah, so here we have this meeting and it's, supposed to be his first meeting with Russell. But as we know, in 64, Paul and John were active with his Peace Foundation. Right. So well, this, it leaves it a, says they a met twice over. in 66, but it doesn't say it was their first meeting. Mm, good point. So when did their first meeting happen? is my question. When could this have taken place? Any thoughts? Jerry's out. Well, it's interesting that when Lane initially met Paul, it was at a party that Paul was attending. And I don't know if that party was associated with Russell or not, but it seems like, you know, those were kind of the circles that Mark Lane was moving in, was, you know, Russell's circle. And so if Paul, you know, if they met in, if that party was in late 65, you know, and Paul was there, I don't know, it seems like that, yeah, Paul possibly, you know, already was uh, associating with Russell at that point. But that'll be, that is an interesting research uh, pathway that can be looked into if it's, uh, earlier meetings between Paul and Russell. So, yeah, in um, Paul 2.0, which I really like that, <laughs> um, his account is different. It sounded different from um, an interview he did on The View. And we'll get into that a little, I think, in next two slides or so. Okay. So, it, this is where we start to you know, muddy up those waters where we can't really <clears throat> determine exactly when these meetings happen. Yeah. Oh, but, but the important thing is we know they did. Just can't right. put it in a well. And two point oh muddies the waters a lot. Right. True. He never can have a great recounting of anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, one. I mean, he what he does a lot is he'll take. He'll take a seed or he'll take something <clears throat> that really happened <clears throat> that he knows the fact that it happened, but he doesn't have the intimate knowledge of the circumstance, you know. Yeah. And so he'll riff right. on that. And uh, yeah, and you'll see a lot of time when you cross reference it with things other people who were actually there said about it there'll be contradictions you know i think uh, it was author philip norman who said he that uh yes um, 
he makes things up or he rewrites history all the he time. He rewrites history. I think is, is what he said. You can't. You. I think you. You can't trust the facts coming from him. He's a very good off the cuff kind of anecdote <laughs> type of. You know, yeah. Uh, he has that talent. <clears throat> So McCartney recalls his meeting with Russell in his best-selling book, The Lyrics, published in 2021. So good point we're bringing this up. I'd read a few things by him, he writes. A friend of a friend had given McCartney Russell's address in Hasker Street, Chelsea, and he went and knocked on the door. Well, there we go. That's a riff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. A friend of a friend. Well, who's the friend and who's the friend? Well, but to say I read a few things by him and he went and knocked on the door. I mean, he. No, it's just that it's just this very confusing when we know what we just discussed. Right. All the meetings that were going he, on. He was an appointed meeting and he was part of the foundation. It's not like, yeah. Right. Friend of a friend. <laughs> Paul and Jane were invited in and McCartney recounts how Russell was the first person to tell me about what was going on in Vietnam. Whilst describing what Bertram Russell's Peace Foundation was doing, he explained that it was an imperialist war supported by a vested interest. After tea, McCartney recalls going back to the recording studio and telling John Lennon and others about what Russell had said. At the time, the Beatles were finishing the Revolver album prior to their final world tour. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so he, the first person to tell me about what was going on in Vietnam War. Yeah, Russell. It, it's just it's re just ridiculous to me that that you know he's creating the impression that their first awareness. <laughs> of what was going on in Vietnam and and the peace Russell's peace foundation was basically All the way in 66 <laughs> was you know yeah and when they were doing revolver and it was just kind of a fluke and again this this is leading into the impression like you were talking about Anne of them as just kind of these oh you know kind of frivolous or you know doped up guys who weren't really, you know, who just kind of stumbled onto these issues, you know, and it's like, yeah. Right. And, you know, they had this, in, this reputation of, you know, smoking pot, how, and mm -hmm. then it's just, it's just insane um, how they've been portrayed in the pop world as just being these mindless men when they were really geniuses. Yeah. yeah it's just Ching. Yeah, I don't know anything about this book, the spokesman books, um, or whatever this is, the reference came from. Yeah, it was online. Yeah. It was online. I found it online. And okay. so, you know, he points it to, at the time of the Revolver album, and uh, he also claims that he politicized the Beatles at the time. Yeah. I don't think so. And we'll show that later. Somehow I got his number and called him up. I figured him as a good speaker. I'd seen him on television. I'd read various bits and pieces and was very impressed by his dignity and the clarity of the thing of this thinking. So when I got a chance, I went down and met him. Bertram Russell lived in Chelsea in one of those little terrace houses. I think it was Flood Street. He had the archetype American assistant who seemed always to be at everyone's door that you wanted to meet. I sat around waiting, then went in and had a great little talk with him, nothing earth shattering. He just clued me in on the fact that the Vietnam was a very bad war. It was an imperialist war and American vested interests were really all it was all about. It was a bad war and we should be against it. That was all, it was a pretty good, it was pretty good from the mouth of the great philosopher Slip it to me, Bert. So this is Billy talking on The View. And uh, that's what he was, that's what he, that's a quote from him. So he, uh, 
this is so if my thinking is this is must be when Billy first met Russell. And this is how it all went down. And it sounds like he could have been with Jane. He was with Jane at the time. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, or it's just BS, <laughs> you know, and that's the thing with him is it's like, he, you know, there's so much uh, you, you can't tell what's an actual, you know, what's his actual experiences and what is something again. He's just he's just he's riffing just, on. He creates the story. The narrative. Right. Right. OK, wait a minute. Did I, is that the wrong reference? Yeah, um, well, yeah, here's here's where it is with the Beatles, Tony Simpson, and I, it's the same. Oh, this I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, that's the wrong reference. That slip it to At, me. I'm sorry, that was the wrong reference. That's the openculture.com. Yeah, and here oh. here is where it's written and actually on the book. So that was this, this is the same as the previous and people can you guys can all um, stop and read slides. Yeah. In 1966, Mort Lane came to the Lon to London to finish Rush to Judgment, his best selling book, which was published in August that year. Was Mark Lane the friend of a friend who passed on Russell's Chelsea address to Paul? Lane had apparently met McCartney at a party in London. There was talk that Paul might write some music for the film, which noticeably has none. This again was from that spokesmansbooks.com. Right, so there again, we have another reference to he was going to write that film score and he didn't. Um, it makes sense that maybe uh, Mark was the friend of a friend. Uh, I don't know when Paul met Russell. It's, Right. I think this website, I haven't looked at it, but it seems like, you know, they're just trying to create a continuity between yeah. the different the different accounts, you know. Um, so, I mean, if if account from the replacement or Paul 2.0 is nonsense, yeah. then, you know, trying to create a continuity from that is, you know. Right. We had not going to work. We had a special guest on um, last year. show. Last show, and she called him Paul 2.0. And I really right. like it's, uh, it, it's yeah, it's it's a day way when you want to sit there and say Paul, which Paul? Oh, Paul 2.0 is Billy. So thank you for that, <laughs> Lorraine. You're, you know, that was Lorraine. And everybody, go back and watch that video because that's number seven where we did the picture comparisons. So, and the last half of that has a lot of good information in it people it was a long video anyway um next i had the luck to meet a guy called bertram russell famous philosopher and he was just living in london and somebody said oh he lives on that st streets so i went hey bertrand can i come in so i talked to him he was very gracious and he actually pointed out to me that there was this war going on in viet called vietnam so i went to the studio that evening and said to the guys hey you know i met bertram and he's really against this war so i sort of explain to everyone the issue now then after that john became the activist but that's all i said was i actually introduced him to the issue i'm a catalyst in some way but no he went on to become the real activist as you say with yoko they did that bed in and stuff which is great it brought in a lot of attention to it and i always say people often say to me do you think music can change the world I said, well, have you ever seen our footage of people chanting, singing, give peace a chance to the next White House? That changes things. So here we go again. <clears throat> this is the view. Not, not really. I mean, Vietnam went on for about another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, again, this, this isn't the whole point of this, in my mind. And that's 2.0. So. Right, right. Is to take credit for um you know being the guy who inspired john lennon to be an activist you know? <laughs> and he i mean he constantly he has this in inferiority complex in comparison to john 
And so he's he's always trying to say, you know, well, I was the one who was the real avant-garde, you know, uh, person interested in that. And I'm the one who, you know, and, and so that, I, in my mind, that's all this is about, really. Right. You know, and you can credit not, you know, not to get on a side tangent, but in terms of the idea of John being an activist, you know, um, later on. Um, uh, I, I think it's something that, you know, <laughs> it needs to be pointed out that, yes, you know, he and Yoko did kind of those, you know, high profile stunts, you know, like the bed in and all this time. But it had no um, intellectual heart to it. You know, I think the, the in again, to contrast where <laughs> to what Paul was doing, you know in 65 and 66 you know and john too um which was kind of a more principled directional activism you know that had uh an intellectual thrust to it to kind of what what later became grew into the hippie movement and kind of this more of like these stunts that people would do, you know, these protests that really didn't, I mean, they garnered a lot of attention, but in terms of actually changing things or influencing people intellectually, you know, they really did not have that big of an effect. But that's just kind of a side note to, you know, yeah. that idea of John being an activist, you know, later on. <clears throat> Do you think that maybe after Paul's death that he took it really, obviously he took it very hard, but it was a motivation to continue, um, you know, humanitarian work kind of as, I don't know, a, a way to cope, um, kind of doing it out of grief, um, memory of him because they were involved in that before his death you know what i'm trying to say right well like the and stuff you mean Anne, and yeah. that bringing it well if i was involved in something with a friend and that friend died i would be more determined to get out there and continue that carry on. to carry on for that person and their dream which was the same as my dream mm -hmm. and then because his dream was over it got cut short and it was over for him you know and since they had such a tight bond you know what's your thoughts john i think maybe in a way you know and of course like the activism with yoko didn't start until whenever that was 69 or um i think up until that point i i don't think john was personally together enough to uh to to do that i think he those years was kind of just until yoko came along he was just you know real kind of reeling from right. the situation and but after that after yoko came along right yeah then, I, I i don't know because with her it's like you know who was she yeah what, what was her exact role um and again, like the the, the principled anti-war movement, peace movement of the mid '60s, early mid '60s, was very different than what came later with the hippies and stuff like that. You know, and there's actual lot, lots of evidence to show that the legitimate anti-war movement that really could have changed things was undermined by the drug culture and was undermined by kind of this peace and love thing that really had no teeth to it at the end of the day. It really had no, it, it, was, it was just more about people acting out, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, this movement cares about peace, but they're drugged out of their minds and they're partying all the time and they're not, they're no threat. You know, and John, like when he started activism with Yoko, you know, he was addicted to heroin, you know, he was had all these personal problems, 
you know, so like he was not going to seriously challenge <laughs> um, the establishment in that way, even though he was giving lots of lip service and doing these things to the idea of peace. Um, you know, but that's kind of another side tangent on how like the anti-war movement was co-opted from something that was serious and had, you know, intellectuals behind it to kind of this, you know, uh, tune in and drop out philosophy that came later, you know. So that's why we look forward to your film. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so here we tried to put together this timeline. Um, I think this is sequential, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Russell finding, founding the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament was 57. The Peace Foundation founded in 63. Who Killed Kennedy Committee was 64. The Warren Commission published September 24th, 64. Then that lecture that Lane gave trying to, you know, raise money there was in uh, December 18th of 64. Peace Foundation and toured Europe. Lane lived in London in an apartment owned by the Bertram Russell Peace Foundation. Mm -hmm. Lane submitted the final manuscript to the publisher before meeting Paul. So we don't really know. We don't know when that went, but. But, oh, well, 65-ish, 60, correct? Well, yeah. John? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Paul at age 22. Well, that's where we had that year where we think it really was age 23. Right. Autumn 65, D'Antonio Lane and Shoneman meet Lord Russell. So it would have been after that, I would think. Paul moved to Cavendish in April of 66. And then Eleanor Rick, Rigby was recorded in April and June 66. Martha born June 16th. So there's that timeline. I think we covered it all as far as, you know, it's just putting it all in sequential as to what all those blurbs meant. It, this is just to help the viewers uh, kind of organize the date because it's so muddied. Something to kind of be aware of in this timeline is that, you know, if Paul was interacting with Mark Lane in late 65, um, it was December 65 where Paul started. Uh, odd things began starting to happen to him and um, you know, you have the the, the so-called moped incident. You have a uh, house fire, which I don't know much about. I assume maybe that was a Cavendish, like as it was being renovated or something like that. Um, I believe it was Cavendish. Right. But there again, was it an, yeah, but it was still a fire in his home. Right, right. And, and it's a warning. You have, you know, um, it's speculative, but you have, you know, just throughout early 66 and spring of 66, um, Paul not looking very well in photos. And you have him showing up in, in May when they did shot promotional videos for Paperback Writer and Rain, looking like he had, uh, you know, fresh kind of. Um, yeah. Maybe look like he had been hit in the face or, or uh, um, hit in the mouth or something like that, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, you, ha you have these things mm -hmm. start to happen or seem to have started happening where um, they could have been a result of him um, meeting with um, Mark Lane, you know, um, and whether or not Paul was aware of it that there was a connection there. I, you know, I don't or if he was explicitly told, hey, you know, stop looking into this stuff or whatever uh, or else, who knows? Um, but then that's that's as, and so far as the timeline goes, that's that's something that's kind of telling. 
<clears throat> yeah, and the the moped accident for everybody that that isn't aware is been a big you know contention for uh, for us. I mean, we there's a big conflict there as far as it was in a full moon. The full moon was like I think December thirteenth, not the twenty. 5th date or 26th date whatever it was that they said that happened um do you guys want to talk about that for a second since we brought it up sure but oh well so if for people who don't know we're referencing so in uh december of uh 65 uh paul was supposedly um riding mopeds he had he had gone home to liverpool for christmas and was uh, riding mopeds around. Um, some accounts say he was with Tara Brown. Uh, there's some other, uh, another, I think another account says he was with Jane Asher, but he was riding at night and supposedly there was this big full moon that he got distracted by and uh, I think hit a rock maybe or something and, and flew off and busted his face up. And uh, went home and there's um uh his brother mike took photos of the of the of his facial injuries and they're in that previous our previous video number seven um i believe i did put that picture the actual negative picture that mike took looks like he had an upper right cross to the eyebrow to the eye along and with the this too along with the fact yeah a hit to the mouth where his tooth is chipped that's seen in that paperback writer and rain video um if anybody well interest the thing with that is um so yeah you have the the injuries which you know there's he's up here on his brow and then his lip you know so you kind of have isolated uh injury points as if you know he were hit in the face with a fist or something like that versus you know what you would imagine if you had come off of a moped you would have had you would have scraped yeah. you know scrape your entire face um you know and, and so what's interesting about you know how he looks in paperback writer video which was shot six months later um is it still looks kind of he you know his lip kind of looks you know, uh, it's puffy as if he were, as if this was something more recent, you know, and when he, he was interviewed in June and he talked about the, the moped accident as if it was just happened, you know, right. I think he even <laughs> said, he says something like, well, I, ju I just came off of, you know, a, a moped and, you know, he talks about the chip tooth and things like that. Um, uh, but obviously, you know, it actually happened six months earlier. And when he was, you know, photographed in, in February at George's wedding and other times, he didn't look like he does in paperback writer video, you know, in May. So it uh, would appear that there's two separate incidents that happened. Very true. He, he was assaulted or, you know. <laughs> yeah, he, he very, he's very, um, Oh, I don't know what the word is to describe his. He's not his normal perky self in those two videos. Um, he's definitely does not look well. Correct. And he said he was going about 30 on that moped when he yeah. came off of it. I would expect him to break a wrist, um, have broken arm or something, maybe you know, even a broken finger <laughs> or something when you fall off of a moped going 30, you you could break a bone very easily, but he didn't have any. So that's how many, why yeah. That. How many of us have fallen off of a bike and skinned our knees? Well, you, you oh. and we're, you know, you're, you're not having a pinpoint, you're having brush, I, his whole face should have been, if that's where he planted, you know, but. Road burn. Road burn, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So Ian, here's the section here on Mal Evans. Yeah, um, it, if you look down on uh, the last paragraph, that's where he talks about moving into the Cavendish. 
and Martha being just a puppy or about a puppy because he the dog is soiling his bed, Mel's bed. So if you just want to read that, that's fine. Oh, you want me to read that last paragraph? Yeah, because it's harder. Hard to see. But there was none, but there was now a larger role for Mal as a studio fixer. As the music became more complicated, he was dealing with an increasingly outlandish inventory of instruments and equipment, and he sometimes contributed as a musician. More than any other year so far, 1967 presented Mal and the Beatles with undreamt of possibilities. It was the year of satin tunics, Carnaby Street, and Sgt. Pepper. The band was at its creative, cohesive peak. On a more mundane level, Paul found himself without a housekeeper at his house in St. John's Wood. So Mal moved in with him. Mal writes of his time fondly, but complains of Paul's dog, Martha, fouling the beds. Well, it's sort of interesting the way he puts it, because then this is obviously 2.0's perspective. He found himself without a housekeeper. Well, he fired them. Mm -hmm. right. Well, Mal fired them. Before well, the, yeah, this kind of, you know, ties into the uh, alleged Mal Evans diary page from the Rotten Apple video series on YouTube, uh, or more specifically, the, the Winged Beetle documentary, which purports to, you know, sh uh, show a page from, from Mal's lost book in which he's describing um coming back with the replacement from Kenya and having to Brian Epstein making him go and fire Paul's housekeeper uh housekeepers because you know obviously they would be able to see, see the, the difference. difference. <clears throat> right. And then he moves in and helps him out for several months and moves his family into the house also. So yeah. Yeah, and the book that Mal was writing, of course, disappeared when he was taken out. What was that, 1976? Uh, early 76. Yeah. 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 Oh, January 5th. That just happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Whoops, where am I? I'm at the right place. This goes more into the next part of the end of the timeline. Paul and Jane visited the 18th and 20th. The Beatles left for Munich the 20, June 23rd. Eleanor Brigby was released. Rush to Judgment released in August. The film. And then D'Antonio resigned from the Peace Foundation. Film released, 67. So this is a quote from reporter Mark uh, Larry Kane, and this is where Paul talks about uh, the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, this, so these are Paul's quotes, and Larry Kane was with the Beatles on all their, you know, tour, U.S. tours, interviewing at each stop. <laughs> Got to know them really well. Um, my first thought was idiots, the idiots, everyone who bungled the whole thing, the fellow who killed him. I don't know what it, whether it was Oswald or not. The official thing's gone out to say it was Oswald. Hmm. He was an idiot. Continuing, from my point of view and from a lot of people's in England's point of view, he was the best president that America had had for an awful long time. And he was creating a great image for America. Seemed to be doing great things, you know. He seemed to have good head on his shoulders, and it was a good and was good for everyone, I thought. And Russia was getting on quite well, it seemed too. I don't know whether this was true. This may have been all newspaper talk, but you get someone like Khrushchev who was knocked out with Kennedy, and it seemed fine. And just the fact that someone bumped him off was terrible. Big drag, you know, idiots, I thought. So what I thought was interesting here is Paul repeated idiots, which is multiple. And he's sort of hinting at uh, Oswald not maybe not being a long lo the lone shooter. What do you think, John? 
yeah, so he was aware of 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 Oswald, you know, maybe not being the shooter in let's see, that interview was August sixty-five. So it was probably the actual the the actual first book questioning the official story was an English book that came out um I think in sixty-four. Uh, it was called Who Killed Kennedy by, uh, I think the author's name was Thomas Buchanan. I'm not exactly sure on that. Uh, but yeah, that was actually an English book. So I, I'm wondering if maybe Paul was aware of that book and had read it. Um, and this was August of 65, where was, we were discussing, he probably did not meet Mark Lane until right. the fall. Yeah. So this was this was common was done prior to that meeting. So he was already formulating a view. And it's interesting too, to me, you know, that he he points out things with Russia seem to be pretty good and how Khrushchev liked Kennedy. Um, it's fascinating to me that that's also something that he was not only aware of, but yeah would bring out because that is you know as we've uh, uncovered over the years is that that kennedy and khrushchev actually had a back channel uh communication going on and things were very positive between them and that was probably a large factor as to why you know the the um Intel world was so um, annoyed with Kennedy was because their perception of him being soft on communism. Right. All right. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Next. Ted. OK, this is from Ruth McCartney so that you can get the context. Ted Kennedy was there. He had just had a light plane crash. His neck, neck was in a brace. He would come visit and hang out at the bungalow every night, which is kind of weird. You look back at it now, hanging out with the Beatles and Ted Kennedy. I went around on a bike with Paul. It was fun. It was great fun. We were there about four or five weeks. I had a birthday celebration out there. George Harrison had a birthday similar. The chef was German, so he made us this joint birthday cake, a big chocolate cake with a big beetle on it. So this so, was from filming of help. Right, when they were down in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And Ted Kennedy was in a plane crash in about June of 64, and he was still recovering. From, it wasn't a, well, I wouldn't call it a light plane crash, but it was a plane crash. Well, she was little at the time. Yeah. She was yeah. only five. So here we have, you know, the Beatles meeting Ted Kennedy and he makes a special trip down to the Bahamas just to meet the Beatles. Now we don't know exactly what they talked about, but anyone can imagine they, um, John Kennedy assassination could have been brought up. <laughs> <You think? laughs> <To say the least. laughs> Since it says he would come visit and hang out at the bungalow every night. And that's key. Every night. Mm -hmm. That is what were they doing? What were they talking about? We kind of covered this a little bit in shadow sure. dancing, but there's really not any information as to what discussions they had to be able to write about. So, you know, we kind of well, it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that the Kennedys, you know, in public, public statements supported the Warren Commission, uh, but privately and um, they were very much aware of what had happened and talked about it privately. And one of Robert Kennedy's chief goals when he was running for president was to reopen the investigation into his brother's murder. Um, and then there was actually, within the last couple of years, there was actually recently um, a letter that came to light that was written by Robert Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy and sent to Nikita Khrushchev in Russia in which they said, look, you know, he, uh, John Kennedy was killed by a uh, by a right wing coup and we're aware of this and we're trying to, you know, uh, uh, figure out how to handle it. 
Um, so yeah, very well could have been that they had discussions with, uh, or Ted Kennedy had discussions with the Beatles about that subject. Yep. Yep. I agree. It only makes sense that they would talk about that. So here's where we come up with the uh, Paul's anti-war quotes used against the bomb. Beatle Paul McCartney had his say on politics to the British nation on television last month during the group's fab fabulous tour of America. Happened during a special ITV film interview with the Beatles in the United States. He didn't use any of the sub subtle deceptive talk that has become a characteristic of a professional politician on TV. Paul just smiled jauntily from the square box and told millions of viewers, ban the bomb. So this took place in 64. And you know, this is showing that he was politically active and against the bomb. And he was known as the band of bomb beetle. ITV filmed interview. Is this the one where they're interviewed? I want to say it was in Canada or something where they were at. He was asking if he wanted to become prime minister. Do you have any aspirations of becoming prime minister? Do you guys know which vid interview I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. The hard day's grind. Yeah, it's a hard day's grind. You see. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure if that was the same. I don't know. It doesn't really say. But I we I just want to point out that okay, this is 64, and here's a stand on nuclear weapons. Yeah. And he was talking about it. Simply ban the bomb. Mm -hmm. So yeah. these next this next slide is the, the a blurb from the uh, newspaper that's coming up. Um, and you have the you have all the rights to these pictures, correct? Um, yes, I have um, a copy of the original newspaper, and uh, I just uh, took these pictures to show well, everybody that he was. I brought this up because this one is your picture, but the other ones I think mm -hmm. I have, which have the watermark on it, but you have the actual um, you have the actual material i just couldn't the yes. the shadowing and lighting was just not i'm not a photographer i know i know <laughs> and i don't i can't come that far to get a picture so <laughs> that's okay yeah uh, so here we go um april 65 i agree with the um cnd they should be banned they should ban all bombs bombs are no good to anyone we might as well ban the bombs as be blown up by it. And this was taken from uh, the Paul McCartney Encyclopedia by Bill Harry. And it I don't know if that was a quote by him or was something in a newspaper article, but that is a reference from Bill Harry's book. Okay. So, and that's just, well, admitting I agree with the CDC campaign, like, you know, against nuclear right. government. So, so next is like the question was to them and what do you seek next john says peace paul and john both say peace paul ban the bomb ban the bomb yeah another beetle interview quote and so that's just john supporting you know also supporting ban the bomb so they yeah. were partners together in that So former international Marxist group leader Tariq Ali says, this is news to me. It was John who was concerned about the war. He never mentioned McCartney, and I never thought of asking him to join us. If McCartney was that way inclined, we would have known. So this was um, a quote that was taken sometime, you know, when John became politically active, that would have been 69 to 75 and sometime in that time frame mm -hmm. um so he's saying that he wasn't aware of paul's you know um activism against war 
you know, he wasn't one. So here we have a change. I think we clearly can show that we have a change here. We see before 67, Paul's saying these things. He's talking about the C, um, CND. And all of a sudden that's cut off. And now only John is doing the peace activism. Right. Well, now we're in 2.0. Right. And he's and 2.0 takes the credit for politicizing the Beatles when they were already politically active down in power. Right. So here's the newspaper article that I was just talking about that Ann has, but I, I pulled the watermark picture because it's a better view. Um, no copyright intended. No copyright intended. It's only for research purposes only. And well, and the fact that you actually have it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do have a copy. You have the copy. Hmm. So I was just taking some shots of it to blow up so people could actually read. You guys can stop and screen if you want to read the articles. And here we're at the last slide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go, no, I was just going to say, well, would you just to quote now, it would not now be technically possible to unify the world, abolish war and poverty altogether if men desired their own happiness more than the misery of their enemies. That's true. That is true. And if anybody has an interest in learning more about the JFK assassination, um, I just found. The 16 questions on the assassination, it was written by Bertie Russell. Uh, if you have an interest, you can go check that out. It's a very interesting read on the Kennedy assassination. Hey, I'm back. Hey, <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> yeah, that was fine. I didn't need to be on camera. But yeah, that was a lot of information. I hope people understand. A little bit more why we feel that this that you know this was one of those reasons why Paul was replaced, taken out. Um, just to comment on the the uh, kind of the, the aftermath of the assassination and, and witness deaths and, and and threats against Mark Lane, kind of the danger element of why this why this um Paul being involved in this would have would have presented danger uh, to him you know uh it's just in in citizen Lane uh you know Mark Lane talks about actually um getting a tip off from someone in the CIA who was assigned to kill him to run him over um and this is also a point is that a favored uh a favorite assassination method of intel at that time was to uh, sabotage people's cars vehicles and you know this kind of you know can be seen a dovetail into the whole paul is dead narrative that there was an incident with a car involved um if you look at um, um assassination uh, JFK assassination witness Jean Hill. She wrote a book, and uh, she was the woman who was standing on the grass right near the curb uh, and saw close up what happened to Kennedy. Uh, in her book, she describes her various incidences with her car, her brakes being cut, you know, her, her almost being killed. Uh, there was another um, famous. Dorothy. The, oh, the or reporter the, the Dorothy Killigan, yeah. yeah, was was looking into it and was <laughs> uh, died under mysterious circumstances. Uh, but there were various eyewitnesses who died in car wrecks uh, um, of the assassination. So that was a favorite method. And uh, Lane, in his book Citizen Lane, also in his book Plausible Denial, talks about being basically stalked and harassed you know both in america and in europe by uh intelligence operatives and people working with intelligence um so paul's interactions with him would definitely have been uh known about and um the idea that paul would have been threatened over them i don't think is is far-fetched at all um 
So that's just an element to point out that kind of shows that, hey, you know, this wasn't just, uh, you know, some kind of intellectual pursuit, but it was something that that at that time would have had consequences, you know. John, didn't John Lennon talk about that? And he made a quote saying that if anything happens to me and Yoko, it wasn't an accident. Do you remember that quote? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, is that your last talking point here on the subject, guys, or? Anything to round up or anything else you want to add? Well, I just hope that we were able to show um, the connections with Lane and um, Bertram Russell and Paul and the dangers of um, exposing Kennedy's assassination um, and brought up some research references for people to go look at, look this up. Do your own research. I highly encourage that, encourage that and formulate your own opinions and ideas and uh, to keep researching <laughs> right the exactly. answers out there <laughs> exactly so and john is awesome he's an awesome research very knowledgeable on this subject and i uh, admire him <laughs> so much he's so cool and a great friend uh yeah thanks thanks for having me uh ladies and yeah invite me back anytime <laughs> no, most definitely we'll be doing that we, we will try and do a new leaf this year and do some more videos more frequently um but the research i mean it takes us it takes a lot of time it takes mm -hmm. a lot of time about three months or more um depends what's going on you know so yeah it's very and we're still writing we want to put two books out this year so you know yeah. we do that uh -huh. time along with all our other things. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, well thank nice, you, John. Nice having a chat with you guys. Yeah.